Hello everyone. This is Manisha Khadgi, Chief Marketing Officer at Mind Bowser. Welcome you all to our DI podcast series. This International Women's Day, we spoke to some of the remarkable and truly inspiring women leaders. Um so I am uh my name is Asma Kapra. I am a um ga- clinical gastroenterologist and co-founder of a um women's digital uh gut startup. Uh, my background, I guess, goes back to, um, uh, I guess, the early 2000s when I was in medical school and uh, decided what my career was going to be and loved uh, GI, loved the, I think, the um, patients. I loved the subject matter and eventually, uh, after medical school, decided to practice as a clinical gastroenterologist in the D.C. metro area. And um, I, over the last 20 years, which is the time period in which I've been practicing, I've developed a strong uh, personal niche in women's digestive health and also inflammatory bowel disease. And so that's really my area of interest. And over time, been involved in kind of multiple activities on the business side of medicine, as well as in the national GI societies, which Hi, um, I'm Dr. Julie Harrigan. I am a hospitalist family medicine physician by training. um, And I also uh, wear a second hat in hospice and palliative care. Um, I now subspecialize in um, clinical informatics, um, and I do consulting for large healthcare systems to help them restructure their electronic health record. Um, I work with companies in physician advisory, um, as far as in the regulatory policy space, anything clinical that touches the physician, the nurses, um, uh, and the and more importantly, the patient to help these companies improve patient safety, standardize their practices, and really become up as up-to-date as possible with the best clinical evidence-based practice. Uh, so I'm Lata Alaparthi. I'm a gastroenterologist uh, as well. I was actually born raised in India and moved here in 1993, I believe, long time. Wow, 31 years. Um, and uh, pursued my me- uh, internal medicine residency and and gastroenterology because of similar interests like asthma, but I also like having the hand skill in addition to the cl- very clinical field, which is a very broad field as um, uh, as you probably know. Uh, after being in clinical practice for 22 years, I decided to step away from a full-time clinical practice, and now I'm doing part administration, uh, part clinical as the associate CMO for one of the Yale New Haven campuses and uh, became involved in the digital health aspects, thanks to Asma and Asia McCutcheon, our other co-founder, um, for the company we are working on. Uh, I'm Dr. Patricia Busby Robinson. I'm a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Mississippi. I'm also a board qualified supervisor in the state of Mississippi as well. Um, so I'm almost, they consider a gatekeeper of the LPC profession. So anybody that desire to be licensed, uh, I'm somebody that can supervise them to become licensed. I'm also the owner and lead therapist of PBR Counseling Center that's based here in Mississippi, Greenwood, Mississippi, as a matter of fact. So I service the Mississippi Delta uh, area. I also specialize in sex therapy, which I'm only the only female woman in the state of Mississippi that uh, practice sex therapy, sexology. So uh, I'm also a sex therapist, uh, specialization in sex therapy. All things sex, the good, the bad, and the ugly part of it. Uh, I Right now, I'm in full private practice. My latest endeavor of what I'm working on is I've just become a patent inventor. Hi, everyone who is listening. Um, uh, my name is Parul Batra. I am currently working as technical program lead in um, a med tech startup called Neuro42. Uh, we build portable MRI machines and uh, recently got FDA clearance. I My work experience has been across multiple industry, not just healthcare. It has been e-commerce, quality, insurance. And I've worked with big companies and giants like Amazon to small companies and startup uh, who are evolving in different spaces. Um, but I've been, one thing is constant. I've been in the program management space, helping clients with customer experiences and uh, launching different solutions uh, that are more scalable. I asked them to share their personal story, challenges, 
success, how they overcame obstacles as a woman leader? One of the uh, things that has been, that stands out for me is um, in my personal practice, um, our uh, medical practice was sort of the largest private GI group in Northern Virginia. And we ended up merging with a large uh, consortium of other private GI groups around the country. So now there's about 400 of us um, in that physician, gastroenterologists in this group. So we're part of this national organization. And when we joined, I realized that this was an opportunity to kind of connect with other female gastroenterologists around the country, because in private practice, you're pretty isolated. And so, you know, I had actually um, spoken to some of the leaders of the organization, and we started this Women in GI Network. And so we had about 50 or so female private practice gastroenterologists, which is probably the largest in, you know, a really cohesive um, group. And so I started um, a program where the women would uh, be connected, get sponsored to go to female conferences, you know, female specific conferences, kind of network, bring programming. And it's actually been really rewarding. And I think it's been one of the nice ways to sort of start my entrepreneurial journey, so to speak, because it was an opportunity for me to see a gap in something that I really personally felt like was needed and really fulfilled a um, something that was really lacking in what I felt like my professional life was. And I remember one of the women who was in the organization had actually said to me one day we were sitting at a conference and she looked over at me and she said, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Like, I really feel like this was something that was missing. And so just that one comment really like was fulfilling. I felt like all the, you know, it was a little effort because it's a very male, you know, centric organization and to kind of be able to do something like that was a little bit of a challenge, but I think the reward at the end was really like um, evident, not only for me personally, but I think other people as well. So that's just sort of a, one story I think that stands out in my journey. Everything that has happened is about the choices, the personal choices that I've made, um, you know, in my career, in my personal life to really, you know, get me where I am today, which is, you know, an executive in the in the C-suite, you know, working with these large healthcare systems. Um, you know, it's really hard to become a member of the medical community um, for two reasons. One, I'm family practice. So, you know, by definition, I'm kind of the low man on the totem pole as far as career wise, you know, not not to diminish family practitioners. I'm certainly one of them. I love my patients, love my patient care, but it doesn't get the recognition that, you know, many of the other specialties do. Um, but moreover, um, I was a foreign medical graduate. Um, I went to medical school. I grew up in Mexico, went to medical school in Mexico. And, you know, and as such, it's again, you know, very challenging to be a foreign medical graduate coming to the United States. And, and I literally came to the US, you know, to seek more evidence-based practice and, and to really, you know, nurture that best practice, which has always been in the foremost of my brain. And getting into things like residency was darn near impossible. You know, I speak perfect English. I'm from the United States. Um, you know, I had excellent grades. I had really good exam marks and, um, and it was still, you know, it still took me three years and two tries. And, and at that, I had to scramble just to get a family medicine residency position um, where I actually wanted to be a cardiologist. So, you know, two, two totally different worlds. But at that point, you know, I really thought that just getting my foot in the door was going to, you know, hopefully then open the next door in front of that and the next door in front of that. I had to really, you know, throughout all of my career, um, a couple of things was I had to convince everybody around me that I was not only a doctor, you know, I went to med school when I was 18. So I was very young when I applied for residency. Um, and in most cases, people just see a young girl and think, well, you must be the nurse, you know, when's the doctor coming in? Um, so, you know, just convincing everybody from my peers to my patients that I was capable and intelligent and, you know, and, and that I could lead others, um, you know, even in more respected specialties, you know, has been uh, quite a hurdle. My journey, I think, um, I always give small credit, even though I don't want to, to my brothers, because they used to always try to sort of compete with me. They were both younger and standing up to them, they were taller than me. So physically and emotionally standing up to them, I think made me feisty all along. 
Um, and I definitely think it was a good character building phase of my life. Um, but I must say, living in India and wanting to be in a in a uh, by you know uh, co-educational mode and really sort of being protective and self-assured really does build a lot of character. Um, I think you probably are aware, Manisha, about the Eve teasing on the streets to all the comments that come your way. And um, so I've been protecting myself from the bullies for a long time. And I think it definitely has, has helped me over the years. To go back to what Asma said, I think there are many, many avenues I've been in with women that are very gratifying, but there are definitely times every week almost, I feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like, okay, I think I could have done this better. And then that, but what has changed over the years is that instead of letting that feeling get me down, I actually take a step back and um, tell myself, okay, why am I feeling this way? What is it that I could actually have done differently? And is that even humanly possible? <laughs> because sometimes we call ourselves imposters because we're always expecting something above and beyond humanly possible. And so when I sort of normalize it and really sort of talk myself through, I come out much, much better. And um, I think that that whole process of really understanding, and that came from a lot of the meetings, sharing ideas with a lot of women, but also a lot of reading. During my MBA, I took a couple of courses that were specifically for emotional intelligence, which have made me so much better in terms of my own communications, but also understanding where other people are coming from and, and, and really sort of navigating other people's emotions and helping them, helping direct them as well. So it's really been an interesting journey, but every single day i learn something new and uh, not only about the business part of it but people that inspire me the most are the normal ordinary people we think ordinary but every person is so extraordinary and everyone in my office i would talk to everyone like a, a medical assistant to the professors and the journeys they've had the challenges they've gone through and people inspire me and um, i think uh, that won't change being in this field, first and foremost, uh, when I had, I'm a teen mom. I was a teen mom. I had my oldest at 17. I was turning 18 that August, but I had her in June, June 30th, as a matter of fact. And uh, I was blessed to continue to go to school. So I went to school um, because I had a lot of help with my mom, helped me a lot. Uh, and her dad was very active. So I always wanted to be a psychiatrist. But being the first person in my family to actually go to college, nobody told me that a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So while I was in high school, they was telling me um, they had two choices. You can do an allied health program while you're in high school. Or you can do a business program. So I chose to do the allied health program because it was centered around nursing. So in my young mind, I'm thinking that's like similar to being what I want to be. However, when I started the class, the teacher, the instructor at the time was a nurse. So we entered the doors. It was strictly nurse stuff. So I was like, oh, no, this is not for me. So I just wiped off medical doctor all the way and went straight into business. <laughs> now, if I would have had uh, someone in my family to pull me back and say, Tricia, this is not what a medical doctor is. You're studying to be a nurse there. So what you desire to be when you grow up is not going to be that. Right. So because I didn't have that, I went straight to the I, I went running to the other side. But to tell you how life can come full circle, I still end up getting into the helping profession of a licensed professional counselor. And uh, I don't think that I don't think God could have carved it out better. But during those times, uh, I had a lot of adversity during that time. Um, because when I transitioned to uh, university, I end up being run over by a car, intentionally run over by a car. So I had a broken pelvis and my sacrum was broken in four places. OK, um, so that forced me to withdraw from school uh, unofficially. But I had to I couldn't go because I was like bed bound, basically. Um, they thought I had to uh, learn how to walk all over again. But. Thanks be to God, I did not have to do that. But I was unable to go to school. So that happened like in April of that year. And I can tell you, I started back uh, working a job in that September of that same year. 
So I know there was nobody but God because they thought I was going to have to go through extreme therapy. And even if somebody see me now, they would not know that happened to me. OK, because I have no physical um, evidence of it happening. OK, so uh, once I did decide, I took a break from that because now I have to pay to return to school. OK, so I did not. I was blessed to um, be get somebody to pay for me to go to school. Um, by this time, when I returned, I'm a mother of three children. <laughs> OK. So I'm a mom of three children. So I returned back to school. I switched my major from um, business now into uh, psychology. So I ended up getting my undergrad in psychology. And from psychology, I went straight into um, counseling. So I did not even break during that time. So once I got my bachelor's, I went straight into my master's and got my counseling degree. And once I uh, got my counselor degree, I said, OK, I'm going to give myself two years before I go back and get my doctorate. OK, so I've always had in my mind, I'm going to get my doctorate. OK, so when I did that, I waited two years from that time to get my doctorate. And this time I was going to do um, sex therapy, human uh, sexuality. So I end up getting um, accepted into Widener University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Chester, Pennsylvania. And I ended up was traveling from Mississippi to Chester. So I had to do that uh, for a couple of years. And I did that. And I'm all but dissertation at Widener. OK, so but during that time, I wrestled with a lot of things that they was uh, doing with regard, regard around sexuality. OK, um, bestiality. Uh, at that time, they wanted to make pedophilia a sexual orientation and all this type of stuff. So I kind of battled with that. And I was like, OK, Lord, I said, you're going to have to figure out another way for me to go. What's going to make me more marketable? in this field um, that I'm in, that I will be able to do this and still be able to be, I guess I've always had in my mind, how can I be set apart from the, from the original people? How can I be set apart? So I felt that, okay, with me having a background in sex therapy, sexology, that I would be able to get in different universities to teach as a licensed professional counselor in the state of Tennessee and in the states of Mississippi, being that I'm a counselor with this specialization because there is none. So that's my marketability. So I was like, OK, let me see about where I can go to get the doctorate in counseling. So I end up on um, going to Mississippi College, getting my doctorate there uh, and I completed there. And my challenging experience, I feel like it's um, it has everyone evolves over the time. Right. So. As you grow, I think one constant struggle that I experienced at one point of time was which direction to go. Am I in the right industry? Am I doing the right things? Am I working with the right people? So identifying and figuring that out was a big challenge for me. Also, uh, trying to make your space in the world <laughs> where it's handled by a lot of... We're in the technology, right? So the technology keeps on changing. People you have to meet different people, especially in the program management space where it's all about stakeholder management, right? Customer building, uh, relationship building. Uh, so initially I was just trying to understand if this is the right space for me. And I went through different stages. I, I was in consulting. So that's where I figured out, yes, I like to talk to different people. I like to set up those connections. And that is where I figured out this is the right space. So I started tra my transition towards program management because I liked the, at, at the same time, I liked the challenge of a product, right? Like a company. Um, so I started moving towards that. So I think what was challenging initially was, again, identifying my own space, making my own space in this industry and how I'm different from everyone else and um, making a brand for myself. And that's what I'm working towards every single time. It's I just don't want to be recognized by my company and my professional work. I'm more than that, right? So that is where I feel the struggle has been every time. How do you differentiate yourself from your professional and personal and, you know, your growth? Um, so that's what I have experienced. And I try to uh, make sure I network with a lot of people, like, you know, um, off work, on work, you know, and then how we can help each other. Because I think being in the space, I feel like 
uh, like I said, you know, relationship building is very important. At the same time, you have to be more empathetic towards everyone, right? So how you can contribute back to the society. So I'm involved in a lot of women in technology groups as well, because I want to promote women and support uh, this cause. So that's where I feel like all the women who have been having challenge in the industry, I want to I want to understand because I've been through that and I want to help and give back to them. Wow, aren't these amazing stories? What advice would you like to give to young women who aspire to pursue their dreams? Um, I think one of the big key takeaways that um, I've seen at multiple conferences and things that I've realized, I think, the hard way later on is that um, always try to put yourself out there for opportunities, even when you personally don't think you're qualified. I think, um, unfortunately, I think women tend to feel like they're not deserving of an opportunity or they're not ready for an opportunity. Um, whereas I think, um, you know, men may just take the opportunity and not think twice, even if they're not ready. And I, I think that's a big hurdle that you emotionally and mentally you have to overcome. And I learned it at one of these conferences that, you know, you can, you can take the opportunity and learn along with the opportunity and um, grow within the opportunity. You don't always have to be ready for the opportunity. So whether it's a leadership position, whether it's starting a company, whether it's doing something out of your comfort zone, I think it's so great to take the leap and not have second thoughts about it because I think you miss out on a lot of opportunities. Again, when you're when you're a woman in business, um, in, in, in any business, you know, I just happen to be in healthcare, you know, have confidence in yourself. You know, just keep showing up, keep putting yourself out there. You know, go from doing the grunt work and don't complain and you know, and be helpful, offer advice. You know, when if you're going to have, I always say if you're going to have a complaint about something, you better back it up with a solution because otherwise, you know. Not only does that make you a complainer, but it also makes you a whiny girl, which, you know, which again, that stigma, you know, kind of breaking that mold and that and that um, and that perception of of women and and the fact that, you know, we may not be as strong um, in in those spaces in certain cases, you know, so always have a solution or at least a proposal for a solution to back up whatever you're complaining about. Um, you know, don't ever think of yourself as just a girl, you know you just know that you are an intelligent woman and there's real there's a true superpower to that um that people don't really realize you know when you come from the back of the line and and shock everybody with you know something either intelligent that you've said or maybe not intelligent but sometimes just your presence alone you know it's it's enough to to really foster that that um you know, that admiration and and really foster those relationships, especially in business. Really want to get into this, you know, and really become a leader as a female. You're going to want to read this book and it's called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And it's by it's by Lois P. Frankel. Um, she's a PhD and it is literally a step by step guide about how to be a girl working in a man's world. You know, anything from how you should carry yourself, your posture, how you should offer up your opinions, how you should dress, you know, all of this stuff. And some of the things I, you know, I realized that that I knew already, you know, just intuitively, just from experience. Um, but a lot of the things that that she brought up were things that I had never even thought about, you know, just posture sitting at a boardroom table, you know, things, things like that, that that really kind of for almost force your presence into the room, but without being obnoxious or overbearing um, or looking like you're trying too hard. And um, so I, I would definitely recommend to any young woman trying to get into um, you know, any sort of business, you know, even if you're not going to aspire to become a C-suite executive, you know, just working, period, you know, anywhere. Um, I would definitely recommend that book. Um, it was, it was um, really just, very helpful um, from a tips perspective. There's a couple of others that follow um, that I liked as well, um, but that one was really helpful to me. Um, the only thing I can add is that to be courageous and just remember that you're not alone and having a network of people that you can talk to or bounce things off of uh, always helps. And fortunately for this generation, there's a significant number of podcasts 
people really pouring their life out there, journeys out there that you can learn from. Um, I have two daughters and uh, you're right, the challenges are very different, but struggles are very similar, similar to what I went through. And so it's, uh, it's very good to have my journey so I can share with them how I navigated with them. So I think having Having either a mom or a, a elder that has gone through something like that may may also be useful for young young folks. Bullying used to be on the streets, now it's online, so it's it's all the same. Uh, so one needs to learn how to stand up for themselves, and so um, I think that that's probably the pieces of advice I would give. So the young woman that is listening to me, I want you to understand that you are enough. You are enough. You already is equipped with what you have to succeed in this life. And I would say achieve because I don't look at success the same as others look at success. For me, success, I will fully get success probably once I die. <laughs> God said, well done. But everything else between this and that for me is achievement. Um, so, but you can have the ability to achieve whatever it is you desire and believe in ourself to make that happen. Um, a lot of humans can tell you no. But if God say yes, that's all you need. And even if they don't believe it, you have to believe in yourself and understand that uh, you may stand alone doing it. Nobody in your family may believe it. Nobody that no friend may believe it. But let's learn to accept what we want and kill the noise, which I consider outside noise, because sometimes the outside noise will paralyze us and prevent us from pursuing what we need to pursue based on what somebody else say we should do. So if you're living your life and living out loud, you're going to do what you know feels good, what you know is right, and going to believe in yourself. And know that you're enough. You don't need anybody else. If you can think it, you can achieve it. And I, I, I hate to say that uh, the sky is the limit, but for me, beyond the sky is the limit. I think the biggest thing we as women do is feel sorry for ourselves. So don't feel sorry for ourselves. Don't think you are short uh, than anyone else. There is a big space out there. A lot of people have imposter syn syndrome. Try to um, manage that and like try to uh, believe in yourself. And yes, there will be points where you, you, you will realize that you want to learn new things which other people know more than you so, but be resilient and adaptable right like this world that we live in it keeps on changing so you can't get stuck in the same point so you have to adapt learn and evolve but at the same time just believe and have that confidence because if you wear that confidence i think you can achieve the world step by step so don't give up I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I wish you and all the listeners happy Women's Day again. Stay happy, stay healthy.